And the day after the battle, things got even worse. General Sir Hugh Dalrymple arrived and set about negotiating a treaty with the French. Dalrymple, a man of nearly 60, had only seen active service once in his entire career. But because of the inflexible law of seniority, he took command. Wellesley was called in to sign the final draft of the treaty, but he hadn't even read the document. This simple signature was to jeopardize his entire career. Wellesley was now desperate to go home and escape superiors for whom he had no respect. Since the arrival of the great generals, we appear to have been palsied and everything has gone wrong. As the French began to leave Portugal, the extraordinary nature of Dalrymple's treaty, the Convention of Sintra, became clear. It looked more like a French victory than defeat. Back home in England, the public was dismayed by the treaty and it was ridiculed in newspapers and cartoons. This is the city of Lisbon. This is the gold that lay in the city of Lisbon. These are the French who took the gold that lay in the city of Lisbon. The French were being repatriated in British ships, taking with them all the treasures they'd looted from Portugal. This is the convention Wellesley came in for personal attack. Juno's baggage and bones, although Sir Arthur, whose valour and skill began so well but ended so ill... Had the British public was not impressed. This is John Bull in great dismay at the sight of the ships which carried away the gold and the silver and all of the spoil the French had plundered with so much toil after the convention which nobody owns, which saved old Juno's baggage and bones. Although Sir Arthur, whose valour and skill began so well but ended so ill, had beaten... This was the atmosphere Wellesley returned to in London. One paper even accused him of being afraid of the French. His future looked doubtful. His career was teetering on the brink of ruin. And he found no solace at home. His relationship with Kitty was as awkward as ever. A notorious courtesan, Harriet Wilson, claimed it was during this critical period of his life that Arthur Wellesley became her client. Wellesley later disputed the timing, but Harriet's story seems plausible. After all, he needed distraction from the growing scandal over the Convention of Sintra. In November 1808, Sir Arthur Wellesley, Sir Harry Burrard and Sir Hugh Dalrymple were all called to face a court of inquiry into the Convention of Sintra. The court sat in the Great Hall in Chelsea Hospital. In 1808, the Great Hall looked very much the way it does today. Then, as now, it was used as a dining room. Here, Wellesley and the other generals gave their evidence, with Wellesley insisting that he hadn't negotiated the treaty and so wasn't responsible for it. But the convention was so unpopular that there was every chance that the court would be swayed by the angry mood outside. When the court eventually reached a verdict, it upheld the convention by the narrowest of margins, four to three. Neither Sir Harry Burrard nor Sir Hugh Dalrymple ever held command again. And for Wellesley, who left England with such high hopes only a few months before, the future was bleak. Although the generals had technically been cleared, a shadow hung over them. Wellesley was determined to escape it. He spent his time writing long and useful memos to an old ally, the Minister of War, on the future course of the conflict. Wellesley was convinced that Spain and Portugal remained an ideal front on which to fight the French and put pressure on Napoleon. His industry paid off. The King was persuaded to give Sir Arthur a second chance. He was to return to the British Army in Portugal this time as undisputed commander-in-chief. For Wellesley, it was a dream come true. Now he could really prove his worth. Nothing could have prepared Wellesley for the welcome he received when he landed here in Lisbon as commander-in-chief. The city was staging a carnival in his honor. 
Shops were selling engravings of his victory of Vimero, and the streets were thronging with Portuguese men, ready to fight alongside the British. It was a heartening contrast to the ridicule and censure at home. Wellesley immediately embarked on an unglamorous but inspired project. He reorganised the commissariat, the department responsible for food and supplies. He knew that Portugal was a poor country and that he couldn't afford to alienate the locals by taking their food. It is very necessary to attend to all the detail of proper food supply and to trace a biscuit from its being landed at a peninsula port into the man's mouth and to provide for its removal from place to place by land or water. The Emperor Napoleon, far away in Central Europe, was not preoccupied with such administrative detail. He believed that armies should live off the land. That's what the French did in Portugal and Spain, and they were hated for it. Arthur Wellesley was determined not to make the same mistake. To fight the French in Spain, Wellesley needed to work with the Spanish army. He travelled to the village of Miravete to meet the ageing Spanish general, Gregorio de la Cuesta. When Anglo-Spanish writer Tom Burns Maranon explored the encounter, he discovered that the relationship got off to a bad start. So Tom, here we are at Miravete where Wellesley first met the Spaniards in July 1809. Well, he couldn't see much of them because it was pitch dark, wasn't it? I mean, he'd arrived very, very late and he had to inspect the troops uh, at torchlight. And of course, Cuesta by that time was fast asleep, which didn't help matters, and had to get up to say hello to this British general who'd arrived and wasn't in the best of moods, as one can imagine. But it must have been somewhere, somewhere here. Por favor, los, el, los ingleses cuando llegaron era por aquí, por unos cerros de estos. Siguiendo por la calle esta. Siguiendo por la calle esta. Está cerrado, ya lo pensé. Pero el final, arriba no está cerrado. Ah. Pero luego hay una finca que está a la mano. Ah, ah, está a la mano. Que tiene caza ahí. Por la carretera sí se ve. Sí, they weren't alive then. They wanted to. But it's, it's obviously well remembered. It's well remembered, yes. It's sort of uh, gone down oral tradition. But anyway, it's carrying along, along this road. It's beyond outside the village where they say that the army camped. The Spanish army of 30,000 men was camped in these fields. Wellesley was quick to find fault. The troops appeared to have no notion of military discipline. Nor did he like the idea of sharing command with General Cuesta. Wellesley was clearly engineering that he wanted sort of total command of the Allied forces in, uh, in the peninsula. Uh, and. Uh, De La Cuesta, I mean, he's a Spaniard, he's an old soldier, he's in Spain, this is his patch. And he doesn't want this sort of arrogant, petulant, sort of young British officer, um, or in general, uh, to, to walk in here and suddenly sort of take over the whole thing. And De La Cuesta was exceedingly suspicious of that. But despite this tension, the two forces did join up. At the end of July 1809, they were ready to take on the French near the town of Talavera. The early stages of the battle provided Wellesley with the closest of close shaves. On the 27th of July, the first day of the battle, Wellesley and his staff arrived at this house. There was fighting on a nearby riverbank, and Wellesley, close to the action as usual, decided to climb one of the towers to take a close look at the French position. From here, Wellesley could see that the French had crossed the river and were advancing in strength. He was so intent on this that it wasn't till somebody shouted out, the French are upon us, that he realized that some French skirmishers had got round the house and were just down there. Down here, his horse was ready and waiting. He leapt up and galloped away with French bullets and shouts whizzing round his ears. Fortunately, the French didn't know who they were shooting at, 
or they might have tried harder. Had they hit him, it would have changed the course of the war and perhaps the history of Europe.